I don't know if you heard it or not, but he said, we're going on an adventure. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to go on an adventure. We are going to be uh, starting a new series today in the book of Joshua. And as we journey through Joshua, we're going to find that it's a journey of faith. And so if you have need of a Bible this morning, these fine gentlemen will put one in your hands. Just slip up your hand when they come by. We are going to be camping out here in Joshua chapter 1 this morning. Joshua is one of my favorite books of the Bible. In fact, uh, as I look at Joshua chapter 1 and verse 8, it says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you will meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that's written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have, the old King James says, good success. I remember when I graduated from high school, my my mom got me a watch, you know, the typical watch. She wanted to know what I wanted engraved on the back, and I said, Joshua chapter 1 and verse 8. I'm excited about Joshua. I'm excited about a journey of faith. I'm excited about understanding all the things that are going to happen in this great book of Scripture. So this morning, as we look at this, we're going to see how things begin to unfold. Uh, Joshua is called upon to serve the Lord. And it's not an easy time, uh, certainly in the period of history that we find ourselves. When we come to the book of Joshua, it's the first of 12 historical books in the Old Testament. And we understand that it gets its name from the man who is going to pick up the mantle after Moses has now died. Moses was the one who commissioned Joshua as leader of the people of Israel going back in Numbers chapter 27. Joshua's name means Jehovah saves or the Lord is salvation. The New Testament equivalent here would be Jesus. God delivers Israel in Joshua's day uh, in a very special way while he is that commander. And at this point in Joshua's life, Joshua is in his late 80s, approaching 90 years of age. He's going to die when he's 110. So even though you may be getting up in age and you're wondering what God has for you, don't quit breathing until you see what God has planned. And understand that God has a plan for all of us. No matter where we are in life, we find ourselves on a journey of faith. And there is so much here that is really relevant for us today. There's so much in the passage this morning that we're going to look at that really impacts Kevin where he is today. I find it incredibly relative to my life right now. And I trust that the same will be true for you as well as we go through this journey of faith. Let's ask the Lord to bless the word of God not only this morning, but all through this series if we, as we have the opportunity uh, to study out his word, shall we? God, we come to you before we open your word and we ask for wisdom. We ask, Lord, that you'd teach us. Help us, Father, to grasp the word of God today in a fresh way. That the life of Joshua and what you are calling him to do would truly cause light to be shed on our own journey, that we would understand, Father, how it is that we can have success in this life. Father, help us to be strong and of good courage, and help us, Father, today to understand how that can be possible. Guide us in the word today, I ask in Jesus' wonderful and holy name, amen. Amen. Joshua chapter 1, verse 1 tells us right there as he begins starting this out. Now it came about after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun. That poor guy didn't have a mother or father. Isn't it amazing what God can do with you? He had a a son of Nun. Well, Moses, his servant, had come to him saying, Moses, my servant is dead. Now, therefore, God says to him, arise. And God begins to tell Joshua, what he has planned for him. He says, arise and cross the river Jordan. And he says, you and all this people go to the land which I am giving to them, to the sons of Israel. Every place on which the sole of your foot treads, I've given it to you. And just as I spoke to Moses from the wilderness And Lebanon, even as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and as far as the great sea towards the setting of the sun, 
will be your territory. And no man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. Be strong. Be courageous. Joshua, we've got a job to do. God came to Joshua and he wanted him to know that there was going to be a great need for faith in this journey. This is not going to be easy at all for him. The first thing he's going to do is he's going to find that the crossing of the Jordan River is required. Now, this is not going to be an easy task. When we get to the crossing of the Jordan River, we're going to find that this mighty river is now overflowing its banks. This is not going to be easy. Now, it could have been easy. I just want to point that out to you this morning. It could have been easy. The most direct route from Egypt to the land of Canaan, the promised land, would not have required crossing the Jordan River. I remember when I worked as a police officer, they used to like to say to guys that they were going to get ready to arrest. Now, we can do this the easy way, or we can do this the hard way. (laughs) The people of Israel could have done this the easy way, but they chose to do this the hard way. Because as they were going from Egypt up to the promised land, they decided that they weren't going to go into that promised land. And they became that hardened, stiff-necked people. And the Lord was very dismayed and discouraged by their behavior. And God said, this is it. I'm going to wipe them all out. And Moses pled for the people. And God said, all right, they can go in, but these people are not going to go in. Those are going to go in. And he separates it out by age. And he says, listen, if you're, if you're 20 years or older, you're in trouble. Boy, I'll tell you what, somebody probably had a close birthday to that date. But regardless, it was going to be the the younger generation that would go in. Joshua, you're going to need to be strong. You're going to need to have courage because the first thing you're going to do is you're going to go into crossing the river mode. And this is not going to be easy at all. The Israelites had attempted an entrance directly into the land from the south. They were rebuffed. If you remember by the Canaanites, it was very difficult. Uh, They wander around, uh, as you know, 40 years is going to go by. 38 of those years is actually spent in Kadesh Barnea. When they finally uh, get word here in Joshua, they're going to go for 20 months and they're going to travel to the point where they're going to cross the Jordan River. But not only are they going to cross the Jordan River, it'd be one thing if God had come to Joshua and said, listen, Joshua, you're going to cross the Jordan River. But he says, you're going to cross the Jordan River and all these people with you. Do you realize how many people there were at that point in time? The estimates are slightly over a million. A million people are going to cross this. Now, Joshua, you're going to need some serious faith because this is not going to be an easy task at all. And in addition to leading all of these people across the Jordan River and leading them into the promised land, God says, all of this area I have given, and that word given in the Hebrew is repeated about 89 times in the book here of Joshua. It's all about God saying, I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to accomplish this this great deed. When you think of Israel today, you may think of it um, in the midst of an area called the Levant. Sometimes you'll hear people say ISIL. Sometimes you hear them say ISIS. I could never figure out which was which. ISIS they'll talk about, but the ISIL they'll talk about. And ISIL, the L in ISIL stands for the Levant. It's that bridged area between Egypt and the forces to the south and all the way up to the north, Asia Minor, and all the nations that are up there. It's the land in between. It's all promised land, land. But you don't hear of it that way so often. You hear of it as being, oh, it's Palestinian land or it's Arab land. It's belonging to this person group or that person group. But we have to understand is biblically following the scriptures, we understand that this land is all God's land and he's decided to give his land to the Israelites. And so when you look at the promised land today, uh, it doesn't quite look like this, does it? 1948, the nation of Israel is kind of reborn. They're able to go back into the land. Uh, and it's a, it's a pretty uh, special time. It's, it's pretty amazing. Uh, but it doesn't uh, really 
take the land that God has promised. Uh, in fact, uh, there's a lot of places here where we don't see this fulfillment happening. In fact, if you look at that map and you look at that, uh, that southern border, it's a little difficult to, to actually pin that down. But when you look at the scripture and you realize how many nations are impacted by God saying, this Abraham is the land that I'm giving to you and your descendants. It includes nations like Egypt and Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Palestine, Iraq, Kuwait, and even parts of Saudi Arabia. All of those places there belong to the people of Israel as God has made this promise. And if you look at the scriptures, it's, it's pretty fascinating. Over in Leviticus 25, for instance, it says uh, there, the land is not to be sold with any finality because the land, God said, belongs to me. He says, your sojourners and your travelers with me. When we come to Genesis chapter 17, we find that Abrahamic covenant. I'm establishing my covenant, God says, between me and you and with your descendants who come after you, generation after generation, as an eternal covenant to be your God and your descendants, God, after you. He says, I'll give to you and to your descendants the land to which you've traveled. All the land of Canaan, an eternal possession. I will be their God, Genesis 17. In Genesis 15 and verse 18, it says, On that day the Lord made a covenant with Abraham and said, To your descendants I give this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates. You see, this was all promised land. This was not going to be an easy task. This was going to be a ginormous undertaking for Joshua. You see how this was going to challenge him. This is nothing that is truly simple at all. And in Joshua's mind, there has to be some concerns. Would you have any concerns at this point? There's a history here. There's some things that have happened in the past. And no doubt these things are ringing around in Joshua's mind. If you take your Bibles, go back with me to Numbers. Numbers chapter 13, in fact. Numbers chapter 13 begins the whole instruction from the Lord to Moses to send spies into this promised land. The Lord spoke to Moses in verse 1, saying, Send out for yourselves men so that they'll spy out the land of Canaan, which I'm going to give to the sons of Israel. You shall send a man from each of their father's tribes, every one a leader among them. And he goes on and he lists all those people. And two of the names that really will stand out to you, one is Caleb, who is uh, there uh, in verse 6, and Hoshea, the son of Nun, Joshua, who's in verse 16. So these men are going to go out and spy out the land. So Moses commissions them to, to go out into the Negev, the plain area, and go up to the hill country, see what the land's like, see if the people are strong or weak, see if the cities are fortified or not, uh, see if the land is good, see if the land is nice. God had described it and said, this is a land flowing with milk and honey. Let's go up and let's check it out. In fact, when the people went in and they, they found this land, they found that this land was pretty amazing. They came to the Valley of Eskel, and uh, just like the song says, you know, this was a, an amazing, amazing place. They cut down a branch with a single cluster of grapes, and they carried it on a pole between two guys. Uh, some of them had some pomegranates and some figs. The place was called the Valley of Eskel because of the cluster which the sons of Israel cut down from there. Now, can you imagine a single cluster of grapes being strung out on a pole and carried by two guys? You imagine your wife says to you, listen, honey, we're having a grape tonight for supper. <laughs> I mean, this is pretty impressive. This is, this is a land that's really never been seen like this before. Well, what are we going to do? Let's get in there. It sounds great to me. I mean, this would be like living in the produce section of the you know, times a thousand, right? Verse 25 says, when they returned from spying out the land at the end of the 40 days, they proceeded to come to Moses and Aaron. They came to all the congregation and they, they told them, they said, here's the deal. We went to the land you sent us. It certainly does flow with milk and honey. And this is its fruit. And they showed them what they had gotten. But then comes the Eeyore pitch. Nevertheless, the people who live in the land are strong and the cities are fortified and they're large. And moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. 
You know who Anak is? They're giants. They're like over nine feet tall. These guys are massive. If they were your offensive linemen, you might win today. <laughs> no one in mind. <laughs> and so their whole rationale is we can't do this thing. The cities are fortified. When you think of a city that's fortified, that means it has a wall around it. What is the, the, the most well-known walled city we can think of? Jericho, of course. Just happens to be in the way. We, we can't possibly go in there. There's, there's absolutely no way. And when the people began to tell this to the congregation, the congregation got loud. And they started saying, whoa, whoa, this is terrible. We're not going. We're not going. And you come to verse 30, and Caleb, God bless him. Caleb is one of the coolest people in the Bible. Am I introducing you to a lot of cool people? I mean, there's a lot of cool people in the Bible. I, and I mean, like, Caleb is, like, super cool. He is, I mean, if I was going to put together a biblical Avengers team, he is on that team. I mean, do you remember that song, uh, you know, I want that mountain, I want that mountain. You know, he's like 95 years old, and the, 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 the giants live in the mountain. And he's like, that's where I'm going. And it's like, what? He is super cool. He is, he is super cool. So he quiets down the people, the Bible says, before Moses, and he says, we should by all means go up and take possession of it, for we will surely overcome it. Do you see a man of faith there? Absolutely. Uh, well, the people really came back on him and said, oh, no, you know, this, this is not a place where we want to go, and it's, it's terrible there, and this is going to be horrible. We're like grasshoppers in their sight. There's no way we're going to be victorious if we go in. And so chapter 14, you come to this passage of Scripture, and it's a really sad time. The congregation are, are literally crying in their tents. They're weeping. They don't have anywhere to go. And, and they come to Moses and Aaron, and they're really ticked off. And they say to Moses and Aaron, would that we had died in the land of Egypt. What an attitude, huh? I mean, these people are really tough. Wouldn't you think that you could trust God at this juncture? You have seen God provide for you. You ever heard of manna? You ever seen quail fall from the sky? I mean, seriously, we have provision by God over and over again. And I know the Jordan River is pretty intimidating, but so is the Red Sea. I mean, this is the God who is able to take you through these valleys and produce fruit on the other side. And the people are so angry with Moses and Aaron. At this point, they'd like to kill them. In verse 10, it says, but all the congregation said to stone them with stones. And what it takes is an intervention on the part of God where the glory of the Lord appeared in the tent of meeting to all the sons of Israel. Now, I'm excited someday about beholding the glory of Jesus. Jesus says that in John 17, how wonderful it's going to be. I want my children to come up to heaven and behold my glory. But the glory of the Lord is another thing. And I'm sure it struck those people in such a way, it backed them right off. And I see the Lord as discouraged a little bit there in verse 11. Do you see that? The Lord said to Moses, how long will this people spurn me? And how long will they not believe in me? Despite all the signs that I've performed in their midst. And then God says, nah, I think I'm just going to smite them. I'm just going to smite them. And Moses goes, God, oh, no, 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 don't do that, Lord, because it's your testimony at stake. And you see Moses intervening and calling on God to be merciful. And God says, okay, I'm going to be merciful. I'll let these people die off in the wilderness. I won't just smite them. When you come to the whole section, there are 38 years in Kadesh Barnea, you really don't hear anything because nothing is happening. The people are just dying one by one. At the end of the 40 years, they've died off. And now it's time for a new leader to step up and lead these new, this new generation into the promised land. Now, if I'm Joshua, I have some concerns. There's a few things here that are kind of concerning. 
I, I'm really concerned about the river. I know I'm not supposed to be afraid, but crossing this river is going to be requiring more than I can do myself. And, and I'm really worried about the people. I'm really worried about getting all of those people from one side of the river to the other side. And did I mention I'm really concerned about the people? Because these people can turn on their leaders in a moment's time, and, and maybe they'll want to kill me like they wanted to kill Moses and Aaron. And oh yeah, there are giants in the land. You know, one thing that stood out, stood out in my mind was the fact that as I'd be looking across that river, I'd be looking across that river and I'd be thinking to myself, I'm glad the giants are on the other side of the river. You know? And we know the New York giants play on the other side of the river. We're glad they're over there. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is, we're glad that the giants, we're going to cross the river and we're going to go to where the giants are. I have some things that I'm concerned about. But you look at this list. There's fortified cities, there's giants, there's crazy people to lead, there's a river. What could possibly go wrong? I admire the fact that there is so much similarity between Joshua chapter 1 and Deuteronomy chapter 11. Different aspects where God is reiterating the same thing. I'm going to give you every place your feet are going to set on, as I promised Moses, Joshua chapter 1. Deuteronomy 11, every place where you set your feet will be yours. Your territory is going to extend, and he goes on and he describes that in Joshua 1. And in 11.24, he says, your territory will extend, and he describes the same thing. He goes on and he says, no one will be able to stand against you all of your life, Joshua. And he said the same thing there to Moses. No man will be able to, stay, uh, be able to stand against you, Moses, chapter 11, verse 25. God is so consistent. His plan is still the same. I'm going to lead these people into the promised land. There are promises that I've given to them, and it's going to happen. Nothing really has changed. Yes, they were disobedient, and they went through that period of time, but God is still accomplishing his purposes. You know, no matter what's going on in the world today, God is still accomplishing his purposes, isn't he? He still is. Going back to Joshua chapter 1 now, I want to talk to you this morning. This has kind of all been introductory, but I want to get to the meat of the order. God has a plan for Joshua to be able to acquire the faith that is going to be necessary on this journey. In Joshua chapter 1, I want you just to see a couple things with me before we go through this, this list. I make these points. In Joshua chapter 1, God says to him, be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. And he tells him that he's not going to, to leave him on his own. You're going to give this people, he says, possession of the land which I swore to their fathers. And then in verse 7, he says to Joshua, he says, only be strong and what? Very courageous. You see, he's upped it. You know, be strong and courageous. Be, be, be strong and be very courageous. And then down below there in verse 9, he says, be strong and courageous. There is going to be an enormous need for Joshua to be strong and courageous. How is he going to be able to accomplish this? I want to point out three ways that we acquire uh, this faith and we have this strength and courage. I want to point out that strength and courage comes through resting on God's promises. Satan is always trying to discourage us. He's always trying to get us sideways so that we don't accomplish the things that God wants us to do. And here's the thing. What Joshua's looking towards, these scary things, I find are in my life today too. I don't necessarily have to cross the Jordan River, but I find navigating this life today to require strength and courage. I believe strength and courage is something I need to be bent on acquiring. I need my faith to grow because I want to just tell you 
in my world, in my life, I don't think life is that easy. I think most of us here would be honest in admitting life is hard. There are struggles. There are difficulties. There are things that are affecting us all the time. Whether it's sickness, death, crises in the family, crises at work, fears that we have about living in this planet. I hear God saying, Be strong and very courageous. And I'm called back to rest on God's promises. For Joshua, he was going to look back and he was going to see some of the amazing things that God had done. And he needed to be very careful not to forget them. In fact, as we'll see, when the people of Israel cross the Jordan River, God's going to ask them to do something that will allow them to remember that promise of protection long after they've crossed that river. You and I are reminded that we need to rest on the promises of God. God is a faithful God. I've never known him not to come through. One of the things I miss in the church today are times when we used to share testimonies for long periods of time about the faithfulness of God. All of us here that have known the Lord and walked with the Lord for a period of time can no doubt give testimony how God has provided, how God has come through, how we have seen amazing things that God has done. God is always faithful. When it comes to his promises, yet future, we know that he will come through. There is no question about this in our mind. We need to be remembering that. I remember the old hymn, Standing on the Promises. I remember they used to say, you can never sing that hymn sitting down. We stand on those promises that God has made. How important they truly are. The second thing we need to remember in order to be strong and courageous is that strength and courage come through a daily renewal by renewing God's principles. Notice with me here this passage of Scripture that begins to speak to this. In verse 7, God says to Joshua, only be strong and very courageous. Be careful, he says, to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Be careful. This calls for prudence. It calls for careful scrutiny. If you're careless, he's saying, it could really cost you. You need to be very careful to, he says, do according to all. We can't be content with with partial adherence to God's law. That's not going to get it done. We have to be careful to look at God's word as as a unit and say, this is really, really important. And I need to be able to follow it as closely as possible. He says, don't turn away from it. Don't turn away. Be careful to... To observe it, he says, as Moses, my servant, has commanded you, don't turn from it to the right or to the left. Love that old song, children keep in the middle of the road. Don't you turn to the right. Don't you turn to the left. Just keep in the middle of the road. You see, when, when we're walking with God, we need the word of God. We need the, the importance etched into our mind. And God warns Joshua here. He warns him, be careful. Don't take God's word lightly. And this next verse is just riveting to me as as I've stated earlier. This book of the law, he says, shall not depart from your mouth, but you'll meditate on it day and night. The law is not to leave your mouth, Joshua. You're needing to be thinking about this all the time. You need to be preoccupied by the word of God. You need to be preoccupied with it. It needs to be a central point in your life. You're not going to be able to succeed without it. It needs to be of central focus. And then he goes on and he says, you need to be meditating on it day and night. Now, the best way I can think about meditating about something is really to obsess about it. Do you obsess about things? You probably obsess about something. 
there's probably something in your life that if you ask someone close to you, do you obsess? Do I have any obsessions? And the truth of the matter is when we're thinking about meditating on the word of God, we are really obsessing over the word of God. We're not departing from it. We're, it's in our mouth. It's in our heart. It's in our life. It's, it's central focus. And he is saying to Joshua, this needs to be your world because you're being called to do some really, really exciting things. But he doesn't end there. He says, you need to obey it. You need to live life in light of what God's word says. I think we know a lot more about God's word than we obey. See this Bible version right here? I could write right on it. Bible version, Kevin Cassidy's version. Because it's easy to obey what we want to obey, isn't it? We can learn it. We can, we can know it. We can even talk about it. We can even meditate about it. We can obsess about it. The hard part is obeying it, isn't it? That's what it really comes down to. Taking the time to obey the word of God, Joshua. Obsess about it. Be thinking it through. Notice as this verse concludes itself, it goes down through and it says, you're needing to, to really focus on the book of the law. Meditate on it so that you may be careful to do according to all that's written in it. You need to be careful about it again. And it's so important, for he says, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you'll have good success. I, I love that. But I understand that if I go my own way, if I go my own direction, then there's no more guarantees that I'll have that type of success. Now, how many of you ever have built something according to a blueprint? A few of you have. How many of you have ever assembled something according to directions? How many wish you'd use the directions? <laughs> yeah. You see, the problem is when we modify things, when we start thinking to ourselves, I'm really not sure why that pylon is there. I mean, that's a weird place for it. And, and you just kind of take it out. And, and then you kind of wonder why, you, why, you know, we didn't, did, did, was there a sunken living room on this plan? Maybe I shouldn't say sunken, maybe it's sinking. We do the same thing when we apply scripture, don't we? Or we don't apply scripture. We want it to come out and look perfect. We want the results of following the blueprint. We, we want that there. That's why we selected it. We're trying to put this thing together, and we got it, and we got the directions out, and we're looking at it, and, and, and it's just a simple game called mousetrap, and we're trying to figure out where these pieces go. We, we know what we want it to look like. We want it to look like the front of the box. We want to have good success. We want to be prospering spiritually. But man, that is one tough commandment. So we just kind of fold it nicely and rip it out. You know, that's what God is telling Joshua not to do. He's saying, listen, you need to be absolutely obsessing about the scripture and so diligent so that you are following every little bit of it. And he makes him a promise. He says, if you do that, you will prosper. You will be blessed. Now, he's not saying you won't have pain. He's not saying that when you get to that mountain, all the giants will all of a sudden have malaria and be sitting on the sideline and you can just kill them easily. He's not saying that, listen, you know, I'm just going to take care of it. I'll wipe everything out and you just cross and I'll, I'll pave a bridge across there made out of, you know, asphalt and you guys can all go in. You're going to have to faith journey through these processes. He's not saying to us, listen, your life is going to be ideal if you'll just follow the word of God. What he is saying is, I will be with you every single step of the way, and you will be blessed. And there are future promises that there is no question about that we look forward to seeing that fulfillment in our life where we will enjoy the fruits of that. 
Third thing that God says to Joshua, and it's incredibly important. He says, strength and courage is going to remember that I'm with you. Verse 9, he says, have I not commanded you? Have I not commanded you, Joshua? This is a command. I mean, listen, God is saying this is a command. He says, be strong and be courageous. Don't tremble or be dismayed. And he tells us why. He says, for the Lord, your God is with you wherever you go. The promise that God is with me is absolutely enormous. I can't go through this life without him. Can't do it. I need him every step of the way. I am so thankful that when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we are baptized or immersed into the body of Christ and we receive the Holy Spirit of God. God's spirit is in us. God's presence is with us. So if God tells you to take that mountain, if God tells you to go into that land, if God tells you he has a journey for you, remember this, he is with you every single step of the way. We need that. We need to be reminded of that. Because what Satan loves to do is to get us to think that we're on our own. That somehow God has left us someplace. And I just love it how God reminds us of his presence. He does it in a lot of different ways. And sometimes he does it in creative ways. I remember back in the, uh, in the 90s, I was up at about 12,000 feet, 11,000 feet up in the Rocky Mountains. And I was on a horse. I was actually elk hunting out there, and I was successful, and then they put me to work after that. There was a whole camp that needed to be taken down. It was just a, an outpost camp, and we had all these horses, and we had to load everything up in their backs and haul them down this mountain. And I get up on this mountain, and I, we were riding along, and, and uh, it was a little bit of light snow, and I looked up, and the weirdest thing happened. There was a little balloon floating down. You know those helium-type balloons that you get at the store? I see this balloon coming down. I thought, well, that's interesting. Literally, it, it, it landed in a bush right next to me. So I rode the horse over to it, and I grabbed a hold of it, and I opened it up to see what it said on there, and it said, happy birthday. <laughs> I said, thank you, Lord. <laughs> the Lord knew it was my birthday. <laughs> Fell and sitting next to me in his saddle, looking over, he said, what are you doing? I said, I want to thank the Lord for giving me a birthday present. He said, it's not your birthday. I said, oh, yes, it is my birthday. He said, no, it's not your birthday. And he made me take my wallet out and show him my driver's license. <laughs> but it was my birthday. <laughs> and I've put that balloon in my file, and I have it, and it reminds me that God knows all about me. <laughs> he knows when my birthday is. He doesn't leave us or forsake us. We have a promise. And, and, and you know, I mean, that's it. That's it. That's it. It means something to me. That's why I shared it. And there's been countless times when God has drawn near and shown his presence so clearly. Maybe through answer to prayer, maybe through God's word just speaking to the moment in time that, that I have that spiritual need right there, right then. But there's no question in my mind that I believe that through my spiritual journey in life that God's presence has been with me. Joshua, you need to remember, I'm with you. As I go through this life, I'm reminded over and over and over again that I'm not on my own, that God is with me. And it makes all the difference in the world. It truly does. And I am so, so thankful. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, God has not given us a spirit of timidity. And literally that word means cowardice. But instead he has given to us power and love and discipline for the journey. We are ready to take the field. We're ready to go on for God. And Joshua is a man called for a very specific purpose. And this journey that he is on is one exciting ride. And this is going to be neat to see the faithfulness of God. And throughout this, I hope that you will come to the point where you realize that, that, that God has given a prescription for success. And he says, here's the blueprint. Follow it. Follow it and know that I'm faithful. Follow it and be blessed.
God is so good, is he not? Would you bow your heads with me as we take just a moment to stop and think about our relationship with Christ? Maybe you're here this morning and you've never placed your faith in Jesus Christ. And one key question I could ask you is where are you going to spend your eternity? Do you know for certain that your eternity will be in heaven? There are many people today who say, I hope that I go to heaven. I hope I'm going to the right place. But my friends, the Bible teaches very clearly that by faith in Jesus Christ and in him alone, and that being a key there too, is that we're not trusting in Jesus and our good works or trusting in our family heritage or anything else. We're fully focused on Jesus Christ. Our faith is in him. We believe that he came, he is God, he was perfect, and he lived a sinless life. And they hung him on a cross and they killed him anyway. Well, he did that, he took upon himself the sin of the whole world, your sin and my sin. And our debt to God the Father is paid for in full because of what Jesus Christ has done. If you place your faith in Jesus Christ, you can know for certain that you're on your way to heaven because it's not up to you to try to secure heaven. God has done it for you. He has made that way possible. And if you have doubts about where you're going to spend your eternity, I encourage you this morning to make certain by placing your faith in Jesus Christ, calling upon Jesus' name and knowing that you're going to heaven. Make that decision today. Now, maybe you're here this morning and you say, Pastor Kevin, I've been off onto the left side of the road and I've been off onto the right side of the road. And you know there's been consequences. And the great news is that you can get back in the middle again. God is a God of forgiveness. He's a God of restoration. You can start seeing the blessings of God. I tell people, look, just start making one right decision after another. Make it two right decisions. Make it three right decisions. Start following God's word, and it's amazing how you'll see things straighten out. Maybe you're here today, and you say, Pastor Kevin, God's tugging at my heart. I want to have that success. I want to be spiritually blessed, but, but I know there's some things I need to deal with. This life is not easy, folks. There are so many difficulties along the way, and God will give to you the strength to deal with those. But the way we deal with it and the way we're blessed despite it is by holding the course with the word of God. That's what he's telling Joshua, and that's the same for us today. We could draw a whole bunch of New Testament passages to support that. If you're here this morning, maybe God's speaking to your heart. Maybe there's some difficulty. Maybe there's some challenges that right now you're facing and, and you're looking at life and shaking your head and wondering how you're gonna get through it. Make the priority following the prescription for success that he's laid out here in Joshua chapter one. And maybe you're here this morning and you say, Pastor Kevin, pray for me. God's at work in my heart and life. I've got some things that I'm working through and, and I need to follow him more completely. God's at work in your heart today. If I can pray for you, I'd, I'd pray for people in a general way this morning. If I can pray for you, I'd love to do that. Just slip up your hand if, if God's tugging at your world. There's things in your heart. Love to pray for you. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. I hope that if you're here this morning, you won't walk away having yet to place your faith in Jesus Christ. You'll take the time to do that. And uh, we have folks at the front after I pray that'd be happy to pray with you or answer questions or meet with you. But let's all stand. We'll have a word of prayer here together. Father God, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you, Father, for who you are. And we thank you, Father, for your promises to be with Joshua. And we know, Lord, as, as your followers today, we have promises. And we thank you, Father, for how we can follow you and be blessed. And, Lord, we pray that that would be the case in our life. And Lord, you'd give to us the strength to journey through this life without deviating to the left or the right. Bless us in the days ahead this week, Lord. Help us to live for you. Help us to...
Make the most of the opportunities that we might bring you the honor and glory that you deserve. And I pray this all in Christ's precious and holy name. Amen.